Welcome to Coffee House. My gods, do we have a treat today. Civilizations tell stories. Sometimes they're about history. Sometimes they're to galvanize some kind of a connection. Sometimes they provide moral exemplars. And sometimes they do all of the above. While much of Norse mythology in our society has been commoditized and is best known today in its Marvel and Disney form, Neil Gaiman wrote a book chronicling the most important and memorable narratives from Norse mythology. Published in 2017, the book Norse Mythology takes us from the beginning to the end and really demonstrates his love for these ancient stories. So, as always, we will go through the contents of the book. We'll do a little analysis where we talk about the quality of the book, and then we'll go big picture to try to wrap it all together. So, the contents, and something I'm going to say kind of from the front this time. <laughs> you know, a lot of times I'll wait until the analysis to say this, but I absolutely loved going through this thing. I loved learning about these characters and the mythology. I thought it was absolutely amazing. I don't know if I'm even going to be able to get across, because I'm trying to... <laughs> be somewhat objective here but i don't know if i'm gonna be able to get across how much i enjoyed this so they're the basic characters we should all already be aware of there's odin who gave an eye for wisdom and uh sacrificed himself to himself <laughs> what does that sound familiar and we'll be waiting for you in valhalla then there's thor and odin is the all father i think was the term that was used a lot of people called him Thor is Odin's son, of course. He's straightforward and good-natured. He has a belt of strength. And Mjolnir, of course, he will eventually get. And then there's Loki, who is shrewd and likable. He can change forms. His weapon is his mind. And he is the father of monsters, or called the father of monsters. So as I said, before the beginning, we start. So we start with nothing, and it's not really clear exactly how this <laughs> works out, but apparently there's nothing, but there's a mist, and there's a gap between fire and the mist, so the fire came from somewhere. But at some point, there's this great giant who is killed to create the world by Odin and his brothers. Then you have Midgard, which is uninhabited at this point, and the gods find these two logs, and they make the two logs into people. And then the man they called an ash tree, and the woman they called an elm tree. So the man made out of ash, and the woman made out of elm. Then there's Yggdrasil, which is the giant tree that holds the nine worlds. It's the biggest ash tree. Of course, it's going to be it's going to be big, but it's an ash tree, and it connects all the worlds. So you have the world of a dragon, and the world of frost giants, and there's this squirrel <laughs> who lives in the tree who takes messages between the worlds, but he tells lies and enjoys the chaos that he sows by doing this. And it's actually from this tree where Odin sacrificed himself to himself. There's a rainbow bridge, so you see all of these flags nowadays, and those are an appropriation of Norse mythology. I mean, stop it, but it was the god's bridge. Only god gods could walk on this bridge. If anybody else did, their feet would burn. Then you have Asgard. Of course, everybody knows Asgard. That's where these gods live. You have the light elves in one of the worlds who are as beautiful as sun and stars. Then Midgard, of course, is where it's like Earth. It's where the works of men and women occur. You have the world of the giants. And then you get a bunch of stories about all these different characters. So there's like one about Mimir's head and Odin's eye, how Odin lost his eye. And he put it in this well, Mimir's well, and drank from it and gained wisdom that way. There are more involved stories. There's the the treasures of the gods. So this one, Loki being the little trickster jerk that he is, <laughs> cut off Thor's wife's hair. And then Thor says, I'm going to break your bones if you don't fix it and keep breaking the bones when they heal. So Loki, trying to get out of this uh, kind of predicament, he goes to the dwarves. The dwarves are this incredible race of craftsmen. And so he makes a deal with these dwarves that they're going to have this competition where they build things for the gods. And there was one dwarf who made a deal with Loki that he would build something, but if he wins, he gets to cut off Loki's head. And of course, I might be missing some of the details in some of these. There's a lot going on here. But that will just encourage you to buy this damn book and read it for yourself. <laughs> I mean, you should anyway. It's short, by the way, so uh, keep that in mind. It's so funny because I can read a book that's a thousand pages and have a 20-minute episode, but read a book that is a hundred pages and end up with a 40-minute episode. I don't know how that happens. 
Anyway, so the one dwarf has this one deal that says, okay, if he wins, then he gets Loki's head. So Loki doesn't want him to win. So he <laughs> sabotages this one dwarf. But they, they go to this event to provide all these gifts to the gods to be judged by the gods. And there's one that's like the new golden hair wig that goes to the woman who didn't have hair. And so that's wonderful. There's this thing that folds into a ship. There's this armor that drips gold. And then the one Loki tries to sabotage... He brings out a hammer, but he laments that it has this really short handle. He said it wouldn't have had such a short handle if my machinery, whatever, didn't screw up. Which, of course, Loki's doing. But it's pretty awesome. You can throw it, and it'll come back to you. It never breaks. You can call lightning with it. There's all these wonderful things about it. And Thor says it's the finest gift he has ever seen, and it doesn't matter about the short handle. So, of course, the dwarf gets Loki's head at least he gets to call for it because he won. And then Loki's like, oh, you have to catch me first. And he runs off. And of course, Thor goes and catches him to make him sit for carrying out this contract. And then Loki says, okay, well, you can have my head, but if you cut my neck, you're going to violate the agreement. So you can't cut my neck to get my head. And so the guy's annoyed because he can't do that. <laughs> and uh, he sews Loki's mouth together. Uh, it doesn't last forever, but uh, there's a, a bit of a win there at least. So wonderful little story about how Thor got Mjolnir. Another story, the Master Builder. And this really, all these show what these stories are like. It's oftentimes Loki gets into some shenanigans because he's trying to trick somebody, be too clever for his own good. And then something goes awry as a result. And then all the gods are pissed off at Loki. But he gets out of it. So the Master Builder, Loki and the gods enlist this builder to make this wall. There's some politically relevant joke here, but I'm skipping over it because this is so much more fun than politics. But so the Builder says that if he finishes, then he'll get Freya and the moon and the sun. That's what he wants. That's his payment that he's calling for if he finishes this wall. Loki says, to, talks to the gods and says, there's no way he'll be able to do it in one season. It just can't happen. So we make him do it in one season. Whatever he finishes in this time, we get for free and then we can build upon that. But he won't get anything. Everybody trust me. It'll be fine. So in the midst of the building, the master builder, he uses his horse. This was the one condition that he gets to use his horse to carry the rocks. And Loki and the god, I think the gods were involved too, but they sabotage the horse. So he can't use the horse anymore. And it turns out the guy's actually a giant and there's a, a bit of a kerfuffle as a result because he's not able to finish the wall and says that they cheated and all this stuff. Then we get on to the children of Loki. This is my favorite part of the whole of Norse mythology and maybe mythology just in general so far. But anyway, so the children of Loki. So people wanted to like Loki. You know, he's likable. He's a good looking guy and they want to like him. He's married at this point, but he has a tryst with this giantess. And as a result, he has three children. One of them is Jormungandr who is a serpent and is tied to a pine tree by the gods who are worried about, you know, what damage he can cause. And Jormungandr can spit this burning black venom. So they decide to send it to the shore of the sea beyond all the lands. And these are this is the sea that surrounds Midgard. So he's cast out into that. And Loki has a daughter. And you see the right side of her face is pretty and clean and well put together. But the left side of her face is bruised and swollen and looks like death. And her name is Hell. She has one green eye and one pallid eye. And she is all polite to Odin when he comes to talk to her. And he asks, are you alive or a corpse? I mean, <laughs> talk about a faux pas. And she says she doesn't really know. She's somewhere in between. So she's cast down to be the ruler of the deepest of dark places. And then he has a third child, this puppy-sized third child, who is a puppy but speaks like a man. And his name is Fenrir or Fenrir's wolf. It's both ways it's presented. But Fenrir grows fast, you know, quickly to the size of a full-size wolf and then greater and greater. And it intimidates the gods. The gods are worried about how big he's going to get and how strong he'll be. Each day he was eating more than the day before and he has these topaz eyes. But the go gods become resolved to bind Fenrir because they're worried about him. So they talk about how they're going to play this game with him. They're going to bind him to test his strength. So the first time, they try to get these heavy chains, and they toss them over Fenrir and say, okay, try to get out of it, and he snaps the chains, you know, without much effort. So they're concerned, and, and Tyre, one of the gods, goes up to the wolf, and he says, you know, I wager my right hand, they're going to keep testing you. And then, so the gods forge these new chains. Uh, these are the strongest chains ever been forged. And they tell Fenrir, okay, if you can break these, you know, this is still the game, then your strength will be greater than all. None of us individually can even lift these things, so you'll just be absolutely incredible if you can do this. And Fenrir says, there is no glory without danger. 
Of course, something that I've saved since uh, in my motivational quotes, there is no glory without danger. So he struggles and struggles against them, and eventually the chains fracture and break, and he howls in his victory that he was able to break free of these particular chains. So the gods are really concerned at this point. So Odin sends a commission to the dwarves and tells the dwarves we need to make, you know, chains that are unbreakable that will hold this wolf down. And the ingredients to these chains are uh, footsteps of a cat, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain. Of course, the second one would be much easier to come by nowadays. The sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spittle of a bird are the things that are required to make these, these particular chains. And one little <laughs> twist here, he says, you say you have not seen these things. Of course you have not. The dwarves use these in their crafting. So there you go. All circles around. But the chains themselves look like ribbon this time. This velvet ribbon. This silken ribbon. But Fenrir is suspicious at this point. He says, you lie, all father, talking to Odin. He says, if you tied me up in bonds I could not break, you would not free me. Odin's telling him, we're going to put these over you to see if you can break them, but if you can't break them, then we'll just let you free. You know, it won't be an issue. This is just a game. Don't worry about it. And so Fenrir doesn't buy this. And Odin's goading him, saying, oh, you're afraid to be tied up with a silken ribbon? You broke all those chains. Now you're afraid of a ribbon? But Fenrir says, you can tie me up only if you put, if one of you puts your hand in my mouth. So that you can tie me up while I have the hand in my mouth, and once you release me, then I'll release the hand. So the gods look around nervously at each other, and Tyre sighs and raises his hand and says he'll do it. And so places his hand in Fenrir's mouth, and then the gods put the chains, these newly dwarven forged chains, over Fenrir. And Fenrir can't break out. He struggles and struggles and struggles, and he cannot break out of those. And so it goes quiet, and the gods don't release him. And just stay far enough back so they won't be snapped at by him. And so Tyre <laughs> resigns himself to his fate, <laughs> looks at the wolf, and the wolf bites his hand off. Then Fenrir says that I will wait until the end of things, and I will eat the sun and eat the moon, and I will kill you, Odin. And one of the gods jabs a sword into the mouth of Fenrir, you know, up into the, his upper palate, to keep the mouth open. But so Fenrir is bound here. He can't break free from these chains. And we have some other wonderful stories. There's like Freya's unusual wedding where Thor's hammer is stolen by this guy. <laughs> and then Loki uses this feathered cloak to go look for it and finds out where it is that this guy hid the hammer underneath the ground where nobody can get to it except for him. But the guy says that he wants to marry... And this is the... Was this the king of the ogres? Who was this? The lord of the ogres who this is. Okay. So he wants to marry Freya. Freya is one of the gods and she's gorgeous. And uh, everybody wants Freya. <laughs> so he wants to marry Freya. That's his his price to get the Mjolnir back. So the gods are brainstorming how they can do this, and they decide that Thor is going to need to cross-dress and pretend to be Freya as part of the wedding <laughs> so, so they can figure out how to get Mjolnir back. And Loki is dressed as a, a maiden who's accompanying Thor, and so they go to this wedding, and they're going through all the festivities, and the Lord of the Ogres goes in and tries to lift the veil to give Thor a kiss, and he catches a glimpse of Thor's eyes, and he says he just sees this terrifying, <laughs> burning look in Thor's eyes, and he says, I'm not so sure about this. And Loki has to convince him that it's just the burning passion that she has, that Freya has for the Lord of the Ogres. But eventually, and I can't remember the particulars of this, of how Thor gets his hammer back, but he, he gets it back and puts the guy down, Lord of the Ogres down, and, and it all moves on from there. But it's just such a funny little situation. And I wonder, because so much in Final Fantasy VII, sorry to go all nerdy on you, but so much in Final Fantasy VII is based on Norse mythology. There's like Midgar, Midgar, which has a Midgar serpent that is near it that you have to traverse to get to this one area. There are a bunch of other names that come from Norse mythology and, you know, a lot of summon spells and that kind of thing. But you have this one situation where Cloud has to cross-dress to get into this one area. <laughs> and, and I wonder if that it was inspired by Norse mythology specifically. But anyway, so then you have the Mead of the Poets, where you have the dwarves who have this uh, mead that's of poetry and wisdom. So you drink it and you become just incredible at poetry and super wise. So Odin disguises himself to try to get this, but it's guarded by the daughter of the holders of the mead. And so he seduces her and sleeps with her and then says that <laughs> he wanted to be able to write poetry of her lips and hair, you know, profound poetry. And he wasn't able to because he didn't have the inspiration. So he needs to drink <laughs> the mead of poetry and wisdom. So that's how he gets to it. And she says, OK, you can take one sip to be able to write more incredible verse about my lips and hair. But you have to put it down. I'll get in trouble if you have any more than one sip. And 
And so he drinks the whole thing, of course. And she notices it, gets mad, tries to attack him, but he flees, locks her in, and, and he gets to be super wise and amazing at poetry, apparently. Then Thor, like, at one point, he goes to the land of the giants. I, I shouldn't go through all of these like this because there are so many good ones. So whatever, you can read it. It's, it's short, like I said. I'm going to go through it anyway. So he's initially, he's hitting giants with his, with Mjolnir, and the giants are mocking him, saying, oh, did an acorn fall on my head? <laughs> and giving him crap about that. And then they're like, oh, you're so weak, Thor. And try these challenges. So one of them was to drink mead out of this bottomless, you know, mead skin or whatever, whatever they drank out of. And he was supposed to lift this cat, and he couldn't leave, lift it. But he couldn't finish the meat. He drank and drank, but he couldn't finish it, and he had to stop. And then there's this cat. They're like, oh, just lift the cat. We'll see if you can even do that. And he can't lift the cat. He just gets, like, one leg up and couldn't do it. Then they say, all right, so wrestle one of us, but you're not going to be able to wrestle any of us, you know, of the men here. So wrestle this old woman who's barely taller than you are. So we'll see if you can win at that wrestling match, see if you're even worth it. And he fails miserably, and the woman just kind of... Not Knocks him down. He goes down to one knee. And so he's failed at all these challenges. And Thor's having second guesses about how strong he actually is. And that he eventually finds out, they tell him, that there were these bunch of illusions that they were using. So when he drank out of the mead, he actually had been drinking the sea. And it was enough to create the tides. He drank it down so far <laughs> so far that he created the tides. The cat was actually not a cat. It was Jormungandr. It was the, the serpent that surrounds. Of course, the, the serpent had grown large enough. It's depicted often as biting its own tail. But it, it had encircled the entire world, all of Midgard. And so he was actually trying to move that. And he was able to move it a little bit. So they were absolutely blown away by this. And the old woman was actually old age. He was specifically fighting... <laughs> old age itself and nobody can beat it but he only fell to one knee when going up against it so that was super impressive so now the people who had seen the giants who had seen him do all these things they decide okay we are just not going to let you find us because we were worried about you being strong enough to take us out so we're just not going to let you find us and we're going to hide from the gods now and then they disappear and all their encampment and everything disappears beautiful story then we get to the last days of Loki. So Loki, obviously, the trickster has been engaging in all sorts of shady business to this time. But the gods keep him around because he's funny and smart. But at this point, this is Loki pushing it a little too far. So Baldur is one of Odin's sons. He's loved by everybody. He's very good looking and likable and all that stuff. But Loki engages in a practice that gets Baldur killed. And then he also sabotages, they go to hell to try to get Baldur returned. Hell, of course, is the daughter of Loki. To try to get Baldur uh, returned from the underworld. But Loki sabotages this situation. So now the gods have had it. Loki flees and he goes to this one area, he becomes a fish, but he gets caught by Thor and the other gods with a net. And they bring Loki back to this area, I think it was like a cave or something like that, but they bring him to this and bring his sons and wife as well. They had agreed, the gods had agreed not to kill Loki. Uh, that was something that was beyond what they would do, is kill another one of the gods who was a son of Odin. But they decide to punish him pretty severely at this point. They bind him, they kill his son, and bind him in the entrails of his son. And his wife is there and has to watch all this. And his wife is told to bring the biggest bowl that they had. And they have the snake and they have the poison dripping onto Loki's face. And so he's just in agony, suffering from this poison. He's supposed to do this for all time. He's bound there and has to do this for all time while his wife sits there, holding this bowl that's collecting the poison and then tips over and pours on him. So sad turn of events for Loki. <laughs> and then we come to, of course, Ragnarok. And uh, this is another one that shows up in Final Fantasy. It's it's a ship. It's a sword in Final Fantasy VII. It's a ship in Final Fantasy VIII that you can get. Anyway, but uh, back to this awesome stuff. So Ragnarok is, of course, the end times. And it begins with the winter. There are great battles all across the nine worlds. Brothers fight brothers. Fathers fight sons. Children fight parents. It's everybody against everybody. And all of the things that you thought were secure are unraveling. The few living people left after that great war live like animals. The sun will disappear as if eaten by a wolf. It becomes icy cold and there's just winter followed by winter followed by winter. There are earthquakes and the living places crumble. And all of the shackles will be destroyed. And this is important because, of course, the shackles destroyed, that means Fenrir is released and destruction will follow. 
So he wreaks havoc on the world, and he's gigantic at this point. Yormungandr spews poison all over the place. There's no more life in the oceans. Loki even escapes where he was being held, and he becomes the helmsman of a ship made of the fingernails of the dead. And Loki, he's, he actually steers the ship, but the leader of the Frost Giants becomes captain of the ship. And Loki's army will be that of Hell. And Hell's army is made up of those who died uneasy deaths. So it's this undead army that is marching to fight in this final battle. And it, this undead army and Hell are determined to destroy everything that lives and loves on Earth. And then Hendel... One of the gods will blow a horn. Odin will ride his horse to hear whispers of the future from this kind of soothsayer. Then Yggdrasil, the great tree that holds all the worlds, will shake and you have a final battlefield. And Thor will ride beside Odin to this final battle. So Odin makes for Fenrir and Thor makes for Jormungandr. And in the battle, Thor will actually kill the serpent. But Jormungandr will spew poison all over. The, the poisonous sacks will break and will cover Thor and eventually kill him. So he dies in that battle, although he is victorious. And it turns out Fenrir at this point is bigger than the sun, bigger than the moon, and he eats both and eats Odin and kills Odin at this point, the All-Father. And then Odin's silent son, I think his name is Vida or something like that, will thrust a foot into Fenrir's mouth made of leather from all discarded scraps of leather for all time. So this is something that has been growing for all time, and it's kind of a curious way to defeat this this beast at the end times. But in step, he'll step on the lower jaw with this leather boot, and there's this uh, admonition at this point that says that everybody who wants to contribute to this fight give their scraps of leather to their boots. So apparently the footwear was very important. So he steps on the lower jaw, and he rips off the upper jaw, and that's how Fenrir meets his end. And then it's only of the gods, Loki, who is standing and goes through this battle, you know, this end battle, against Hendel and his forces. And Loki's final words will get to be, it is done, I won. And he says this as Loki dies, but not before he'll, he hears Hendel's last words. He's also dying from uh, wounds in the battle. But he uses his dying breath to say that the sons of Thor live... Life and life's yearning, these are man and woman, or woman and man, I think, yeah, that's how it works. So woman and man, woman is life, and man is life's yearning, will survive. They'll hide in the tree, the great tree, Yggdrasil, and remember the great tree is an ash tree, and they will be the source of rebirth. So Loki ends up dying on the frozen battlefield. There's this burning giant who was there before everything, who will burn everything. The world will be cremated at this point. Nothing will remain but ash. The swollen ocean now will swallow the ash, and it's the final destiny of the gods. And then what will come after the end? The sun's daughter will shine anew. Woman and man will come from the ash tree. Odin's sons and Thor's sons. And now it takes two of them, two of Thor's sons, to carry Mjolnir. <laughs> but they will survive, and the game begins anew. So that's the end of the book, The Norse Mythology, by Neil Gaiman. <laughs> Moving into the analysis, it's exceptionally enjoyable. I absolutely loved this book. I loved the stories. I loved the way it was told. The writing itself was so easy to follow. It was easy to know what was happening, but it still had an aesthetic flavor. It was told in this very clean narrative. Uh, the love for ancient mythology just really comes through. I really loved every moment of going through this book. <laughs> There were a couple of stories that weren't as fun or energetic as the other ones. And there's something kind of more tame about other systems of mythology and more directly morally applicable. It didn't seem like there were all that many things that were kind of applicable to your life and how you should act. <laughs> this is mostly just God shenanigans. And I don't know if there's more of a moral bent to a lot of the other stories that maybe he would have left out. I don't know how comprehensive this is or something like that. But most of this isn't like, okay, you should be like Thor or, you know, don't do what Loki does, you know, that kind of thing. It was more just uh, God shenanigans. So, yes, I absolutely think uh, that everybody should get it. Everybody should read it. It was just so much fun. So much fun to read. Big picture wise, uh, we use mythology to deal with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. You know, we always have the weight of the universe bearing down on us when we haven't sufficiently distracted ourselves from it. And we need some way to manage it. And that's what mythology does for us. Norse mythology contains some of my favorite stories. I mean, Fenrir, for selfish reasons, is my favorite mythological character. I think he's absolutely fantastic. And I love that these mythological characters have so much dimension to them. It's not just, here are the good ones, here are the bad ones. Uh, there's so much to it. 
But one thing we are losing, one thing that kept tribes together for all of human history, is we are losing those shared stories. Film is not such a big deal anymore. After, I know, after the um, pandemic, that was something something I was completely into. I used to watch film all the time. But it, it's not such a shared thing anymore, you know, especially when you are able to watch it not with a bunch of your compatriots in a theater where you all get to react at the same time, but you can watch it at home. It's more of a solo activity now. It's not so much a shared experience. And then you have a bunch of attacks on history and that sort of thing. I was watching actually like a streetcar named Desire yesterday. I just turned it on. I'm going through all the movies that I own in alphabetical order. <laughs> so uh, that's the one that I was on. But I was thinking about how it used to be an event, you know, when you would all this movie would come out and people would go see it and it would give you these ideas and things to talk about and things to work through. You know, it used to be a shared event and society would then have this shared conversation, the shared means to deal with animalistic men and insecure and downtrodden women who are struggling to maintain dignity in a faltering world. You know, all the things that are addressed by this kind of a story. And then we had the shared complex language to discuss these things, you know, when they would arise or when we had questions about them. But we no longer have that kind of churning societal cauldron that's working through complex emotional and intellectual issues. Now it just seems like we're given, here are the four words that you're allowed to use to discuss each topic. And that's, that's all we have. So I think it's uh, severely undermines that collective mythos that keeps us together, that gives us a shared language. But anyway, so that that was Coffee House. I really appreciate you listening. I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And I am not sure I'm not sure what book is coming up next, but we'll we'll say that in the discussion episode. We'll pick which book we're going to do next. I'm going to be more active on Twitter to make sure I get these things out in a timely manner. And I, I hope all is well. Please, you know, subscribe. If you enjoy this uh, podcast, uh, we're trying to round this out quality-wise. <laughs> and and now it would be a good time, if you enjoy it, to leave a review and uh, so we can expand a bit. But regardless, I really appreciate you listening to this. And I hope all is well. And I will see you on the next one. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>